This is the new Creality CR6 SE. In this video, we're gonna have a closer look and answer all of your questions. There's no doubt in Creality are one of the major hitters in 3D printing these days. A few years ago, they had the hugely popular CR10, and then they followed that up with the Ender 3, which is the new budget 3D printer champion. In between, they have a lot of other models, and a lot of them aren't really that significant. This one, I'm hoping, is different. This is the Creality CR6 SE. It's worth noting that Joel from 3D Printing Nerd, as well as Chuck from Filament Friday, have both already released videos on this printer. They're both great and they're linked below so you can check them out. To keep this video interesting, I put out a query on YouTube community as well as on Patreon. What questions do you still have about the Creality CR6 SE? We'll start by unboxing the printer, seeing what's inside, assembling it, and then doing our first test print. And after that, we'll jump in in great detail trying to answer your questions. been a few days, I'm back, I've done some test prints, and I've had a good look over the printer. Let's get to answering your questions. What exactly is the CR6 SE? The CR6 SE is a 3D printer launched by Creality recently on Kickstarter. I'd say it's a mix between the CR10 and Ender 3 with a 235x235x250mm by by build volume. It has auto bed leveling from factory, as well as other features normally seen as aftermarket upgrades. It's cheaper on Kickstarter, but the regular price will be 429 US dollars, with the printer in this video sent to me directly for free by Creality. Why are Creality using Kickstarter? If we come to the FAQ tab on the Kickstarter project, this question is answered directly. Reading between the lines, I think this is all about marketing. And it's hard to argue, because it took only 9 minutes to fund the goal. With 15 days to go, they're approaching 4 million Australian and just under 7,000 backers. How easy is it to set up this printer and what exactly comes with it? The printer arrived well packaged and one bonus is it comes with a full kilogram roll of PLA filament. It's realistic to be up and printing in under 10 minutes. There's 4 bolts on the underside to join the two halves of the frame. Then there's two bolts in the lower right hand corner to attach the touchscreen. The filament holder simply screws and then snaps onto the side of the frame. Two more bolts on the top of the printer to attach the handle. And after that, we follow the diagrams in the instructions, plugging in the connectors around the printer, of which there's around six or seven. Peel off the protective film and we're ready to turn it on. In terms of included tools, there's a nifty storage tray. And inside that, we have a pallet knife slash mini scraper a spanner for adjusting the tension on the V-rollers, an SD card adapter, a full set of Allen keys, a wrench for undoing the hot end nozzle, some adorably small side cutters, and a really nice inclusion, two spare nozzles, and a range of spare fittings for the Bowden tube. On the SD card, we have a range of pre-sliced G-code for testing. We have a user manual, which I think is quite good. It goes through all of the assembly of the printer, explains all of the touchscreen interface, and also takes you through slicing and troubleshooting. There's a rebadged version of Cura called Creality Slicer, a separate troubleshooting document, some STLs to slice yourself, and a nice operation video that takes you through the setup of the printer. What's new on this printer to set it apart from other printers, such as the Ender 3? On the Kickstarter, you'll find detailed comparisons between the standard Ender 3 as well as the upcoming Ender 3 version 2. The biggest innovation in my opinion is the factory auto bed leveling. It uses a strain gauge and we'll have a closer look later on. This means no more paper leveling, in fact, it's impossible to do so. There's also an innovative quick release extruder, which we'll also have a closer look inside later on. We have features that are becoming increasingly common in 3D printers, such as a color touchscreen, filament runout detection, an Anycubic Ultra Base style glass coated bed. It's worth noting that it's also quick release, and that means that if you wanted plain glass, you could flip it upside down and print with it in that configuration. We also have features which are quite often added as upgrades by the user after purchase. This includes toolless belt tensioning, twin Z axis stepper motors and lead screws, which are joined by a belt at the top, 
a user-controlled LED near the nozzle, and parts that were traditionally printed and added on, such as a cover for the back of the LCD, and debris covers for all of the fan vents. Overall, there seems to be a lot of attention to detail. How rigid is the frame, and does the handle actually work? The short answer to both questions is yes. All of the places where the frame joins together are recessed, and that helps locate the mating surfaces accurately. It's also worth noting that the extrusion the Y-axis rolls on is wider than normal and that aids stability. Overall, this feels like a robust machine, and as for the handle, that seemed to survive my testing as well. What is the print quality like on this printer? Based on my testing, very good. This figurine was found on the SD card, and you'd have to say the surface finish is quite flawless. I sliced this 3D benchy myself, printed at 60mm per second with 0.2mm layer height. I used the base and the 3 configuration in Simplify 3D, so there's a tiny bit of stringing, but apart from that, there's no defects. I used this print in place clamp to test accuracy as well as cooling on overhangs. Once again, this is a good looking print and entirely functional as pulled off the printer. This is normally a torture test for resin printers, but I printed it in PETG. The surface finish is immaculate, and the tiny internal details aren't bad either. I also tested some mega stretchy and flexible TPU. It took me quite a few attempts to get the slicer settings dialed in, but the end surface finish is really quite good as well. This is a very difficult filament to print with. This was the most asked question, how does the auto bed leveling system work? The first thing to understand is that the bed is solidly mounted, there's no leveling springs present. The next thing to know is that everything happens at the nozzle, but there's no probe like a BL touch or easy ABL. It's all to do with how the hot end is mounted. The bracket holding it up is actually a strain gauge, with the hinge point as shown. And here you can see the movement in action. Don't worry, it's stiff enough that the hot end doesn't move around during printing. The first time you power up the printer is press the auto leveling button. That sends the nozzle around the bed in a grid pattern, and I only ever did this once, the first time I turned on the printer, and never again before any test prints. As the tip of the nozzle comes in contact with the glass bed, the nozzle flexes up and triggers the sensor. Does it work? I would say an emphatic yes. My first test print was this series of one layer thick squares spread all around the print bed. When we inspect them post print, we can see that they're all very uniform. There's none that are too close or too far away. They're more or less exactly the same the whole way around the printer, and that is exactly what we're aiming for. I'd say the distance from the nozzle to the bed was a smidge too far away, and that actually caused my second print to detach and fail. To fix this, all I had to do was lower the Z offset on the LCD, and every print after that stuck well, but was still easy to remove. How does the extruder work, and can it be replaced? A lot of people have been referring to this extruder as a Titan clone, but really the mechanism is quite different, being quick release. When you want to load or unload, you swing the lever. This removes the tension from the internals, and makes it easy to feed the filament straight through. When you're done, make sure to lock it back in place, or nothing will print. Ask me how I know. Unloading is super easy, swing the lever, pull out the filament. Loading in something super flexible is still possible, but as you can imagine, it's a little bit trickier to get your fingers in and around the filament runout sensor. That small gap is what makes this hard, rather than the actual extruder. To access the inside, we need to undo the two M3 bolts on the top. As you lift up, the spring will inevitably fly out to the side, but at least now we can see what's going on on the inside. We have a nice guide tube to stop flexible filaments from shooting out to the side and we can see the rest of the mechanism is actually inside the lid, and the whole lid pivots back and forth to grip the filament. I wouldn't recommend opening this up unless you have to, it's quite fiddly to align the spring and get everything in place when you put it back together. I quite liked it, but if you did want to replace it, the mounting plate is very similar to an Ender 3, so something like an Easy extruder should bolt straight on. There was a lot of questions about the hot end, whether it was all metal, and whether the nozzles could be replaced. One piece of bad news here is that this is a lined PTFE hot end instead of being all metal. When we line up the tube, we can see it comes the whole way down to behind the nozzle. I didn't have any problems with this, but if you were having clogs, Luke Hatfield's fix should still work to ensure the tube is seated properly against the back of the nozzle. The heatsink cooling fan bolts directly to the heatsink, 
and once we remove it, it's hard to tell from this angle, but the heat break is exposed in the middle, kind of like a mosquito hot end. Now onto that nozzle, despite having a bulge on the outside, the screw thread is actually the same as other nozzles you might already have. I believe the bulge on the outside is to help it sit nicely on the silicon sock, but the standard Creality nozzle also sits really well in there, just the E3D nozzle with its wider base that has trouble poking through. If you wanted to fit one of these, you'd need to change the silicon sock or expand the opening. There's been a lot of interest in this campaign on the details of the mainboard and the touchscreen. The mainboard is accessed by removing a panel on the underside of the printer. And the microcontroller in place is an Atmega 2560. There's also TMC 2208 stepper motor drivers, but I don't think they're connected via UART, so that means no linear advance. This is an 8-bit board, but since Creality hit their stretch goal on Kickstarter, every backer has the chance to upgrade to a free 32-bit board. At this stage, there's no further details on that. If we look inside the enclosure for the touchscreen, it looks similar to the screen as found on the CR10S Pro. It also appears to have a more complex connection than something like a Big Tree Tech TFT. As for the interface, I was very pleased with it. It was logical, well laid out, and there wasn't any features missing that limited what I could do with the printer. It's worth noting that this board takes a full-size SD card and it's accessed conveniently at the front of the printer. How loud is this printer? At idle, the fan for the hot end heatsink is fairly average. I have heard louder, but it's a lot more prominent than something like a Noctua. The stepper motor drivers, however, are silent, so those fans are the only thing you'll hear during printing. And just for fun, here's a comparison of homing with an Ender 3. What firmware is used, is it open source, and does it work with Octoprint? Firstly, the firmware will be made open source at a later date, as promised by Creality in the FAQ. The firmware is Marlin, based by this file name on version 116. But on the 32-bit board, I guess they're going to have to use Marlin 2.0. As for Octoprint, I left all of the settings on auto and was able to connect immediately. I had no problem communicating with the printer, manually controlling it and starting prints. Is the printer safe and does it have thermal runaway protection? Overall, this machine is a lot tidier, such as this cover to keep debris and fingers away from the belts. The power supply is now concealed inside the frame of the printer and is a certified Meanwell, the same one as the Ender 3 Pro. The shielding of the cables is vastly improved the whole way around the machine and that includes appropriate features such as strain relief and rubber grommets. Thermal runaway protection is easy to test on this printer. You bring the nozzle up to temp, unplug the heater, and watch the temperature drop. Thermal runaway protection is in place, but I prefer the timer to be shortened so it kicks in sooner. How about quality control, warranties, and after-sales support? Included in the box was a piece of cardboard that said qualified certificate, as well as contact details for after sales service. On the back of that card are details around a warranty, and I don't really pay attention, but I don't really remember this on other Creality printers. Basically, the warranty lasts for one year, and this is also extended to those who back the printer on Kickstarter. My particular machine seemed to be well built. I did have some loose bolts around the printer, the worst of which caused a collision between the bed clip and the Y-axis stepper motor, but all I had to do was shift the assembly back into correct alignment and tighten the bolts, and everything worked perfectly after that. Are there bespoke parts? Can the printer still be modified and upgraded? We've already established that we can change the nozzle, as well as the extruder if we want to. And I don't see any reason why the fans couldn't be changed to quieter versions. Changing to an all-model hot end is going to be more difficult. Assuming it moved the mounting bolts to the top, a company like Micro Swiss could easily make a kit that bolted straight up to this printer. Converting to direct drive, however, and retaining the ABL probably won't be possible. In terms of upgrading part cooling, there's plenty of room for a different fan induct inside this cover, especially if you're willing to ditch the LED. So who is this printer for, and is it worth upgrading from my current printer? 
Given the exact same print volume, this printer really feels to me like a highly upgraded Ender 3. It's a lot more polished, a lot more tidy, and with features such as ABL and a touchscreen, it's got a lot of the mods that people add in the aftermarket. Print quality is great on both machines, so really the improvements here are in terms of usability. To me, this seems like it's for someone who wants an Ender 3, but is happy to spend more money to get a more polished experience and all of the upgrades already done without getting their hands dirty. And I realise that people will point out that it's twice the price of a base Ender 3, but it's also only a little bit more than a Prusa Mini, it has a much bigger build volume, and based on my first tests, it's been much more reliable with much better print quality. Whether you should upgrade from your current printer, that's a question only you can answer after a suitable amount of research. So what are my final thoughts? My first impressions of this printer are that it's quite good. It seems really well thought out, and there's a lot of attention to detail in small little areas around the printer. One thing I like about Creality is that they listen. I've been pretty forthright in the past in criticizing them, especially on things like thermal runaway protection. What they seem to have done is listen to feedback from the community and fitted a lot of features to this machine that people upgrade to cheaper machines like the Ender 3. If you're setting up a print farm and you want the absolute best bang for your buck, maybe stick with Ender 3s. If you're after a machine like an Ender 3 that has a lot more polish and a lot more ease of use, then this one might be for you. Personally, I only wish there was two things that they had changed. One was making the build volume a little bit bigger to make it stand out from the Ender 3 for the money. And the other thing is the PTFE lined hot end, which is going to be susceptible to jams if it's not pushed the whole way in. If you're thinking about backing this on Kickstarter, remember the price is cheaper, but there's always a degree of risk. So do your research, watch the other videos that I've linked in the description and make an informed decision. A reminder that this is not a review, this print testing is quite limited and I'll use the machine a lot more before I release a full review at a later date. What are your thoughts on this? Hopefully I've answered your questions, so I'd love to know whether you think this is a good value proposition in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.